All right, three after the hour, let's go ahead and get started. I'll catch up on roll call later. Um, -bum -bum, I think nothing, oops, sorry, wrong window. <clears throat> I don't think anything's changed with the AIs and stuff, so we can skip that. Community time, is there anything from the community people would like to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right, hold on a sec. All right, moving forward. Um, SDK, nothing new to report there, but just a reminder, we will have an SDK call or immediately following this one for those of you interested in that work. Um, let's see, incubator. So we do now have, <clears throat> excuse me, we do now have three end users. Um, two from, two that were mentioned from Adobe and uh, a friend of mine, Appointed me to this Accenture uh, project. That's an open source project that's actually using cloud events. So we were thinking that we could use them as a as the third end user. However, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. It would be really nice if we can actually get a little more than just three. Um, I think in the background I pinged a couple of people and they're working on it. Um, so what I'd like to do is go with the assumption that we will get at least a couple more before we actually present to the TOC. But what I'd like to do is to see if you guys feel comfortable with us actually asking to get on a future TOC call. I can't imagine it's gonna happen for a couple of weeks anyway, because they're usually backlogged, but I wanted to start that process now. Um, has anybody reviewed the PowerPoint slides or have any concerns with it? Okay. Are there any concerns with me asking to be put on the agenda? I did review the slides a few weeks ago. They haven't changed recently, right? They have not changed, that is correct, yes. Yeah, when I looked at them, they look reasonable, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so not hearing any objection, what I'll do is, hold on. Okay, I will go ahead and ask to get up on the agenda. Obviously, if you guys review the, the slides and you wanna make changes, you know, you're more than welcome to make suggestions. I'm open to anything there. As, as I said, if you have more end users you wanna list, please do. Uh, there's also a page in there, where is it? that talks about um, people that have actually adopted the spec itself. Now, most of these guys are not end users, but if you want your company listed here, please let me know and we can add it just to, to show that people are actually adopting it from an implementation perspective, not from an end user perspective, just to help it along. Um, okay, so I'll ask you to put it on the agenda. Um, please review it when you, if you have not done so yet. We'll get some last minute changes in there. Um, Coop, when would this uh, meeting likely to be take place? Are we talking like weeks, months, whatever? Honestly, it depends on their backlog, and I don't know what the backlog is like. I would guess it would not happen for at least two weeks, just a guess. But I, I don't imagine it would be months out. But that's just a guess. The minute I find out an estimate or something, I'll let you guys know. Fair? Thanks. Yep. All right, moving forward. KubeCon. So, uh, the due date for submitting the proposal for our sessions is tomorrow, so I need input from you guys. Um, we have a choice. We can either do an intro and deep dive for both of our groups, or we can do a 90-minute session for either one of them. Um, my current thinking is that uh, doing a 90-minute session for the serverless one, uh, mainly because we don't have that much material, and I actually contemplated dropping down to just a one 35 minute session. But I, what I'd like to do is turn it into a birds of a feather session like we did in Barcelona, where we basically start engaging with the audience to find out what their status is relative to serverless adoption. In particular, if they're not using it, why aren't they using it? You know, what are the roadblocks? Is it just fear and uncertainty and doubt or is it something else in terms of lacking functionality, lacking tooling, that kind of stuff? Um, I, I think we had a fairly good session when we did this in Barcelona, even though we had a relatively small audience. Um, I, I do think it, it might be valuable, but if there are people who think that it didn't go well in Barcelona and you wanna drop down to 35 minutes and just talk about status of the working group and potential future things, I'm open to that as well. Um, likewise, for the cloud events stuff, I, I feel like every time we've done a cloud events intro and deep dive, um, while the sessions themselves work out fine, I kind of feel like there's a bit of an overlap and a duplication of, of material that gets presented. And it, I feel like it might be better if we just go for one 90 minute session instead of two 35 minute sessions and just do the whole thing in one shot, right? Do a summary of spec, status, plans, do the demo, uh, airport demo, 
And then any of the topic you guys want to bring up in there, just do it all in one, rather than trying to split it across two and run the risk of, of duplicating things between the two sessions. Anyway, that's my current thought process here. Um, for those of you who have been involved in the past or, or want to be involved in the future, what do you guys think about this? Oh, come on. I, I, don't make me pick on people because I will. I think, okay, split, I, I think splitting them is, I agree, that's probably not the best thing. So combining them would make sense. Okay, Scott, I think your hand's up. The one benefit to having it have two sessions is that there's a higher probability that you don't overlap with some other session you might want to watch. And people tend to steer away from the very long sessions. Possible, true, yeah. Uh, Klaus? Yeah, so first of all, I, I like the serverless se session in Barcelona. Um, yeah, it was really valuable. And um, yeah, I also observed that those uh, cloud events intro and deep dive uh, overlapping kind of. So um, maybe also by now it's not that unknown anymore that an intro really is needed, I don't know. That is true. Well, so let me ask you guys this. Um, do we have enough for a 90 minute session for cloud events? In other words, do we want to just do one 35 minute session, cover everything in that? Because to be honest, as I was writing this list right here, I was wondering what are the topics we'd have? Because if we don't have anything urgent, these two together, I think could be done in 35 minutes. What do people think? Yeah, I think so. I think last time you also put like the workflow stuff, which we don't really have anything concrete. So I think these can be done in 35 minutes. Yeah. Scott, what do you think? Since you've, you've been part of a couple of these, I think. Yeah, what if, what if there was a cloud events, uh, intro deep dive, single session, 35 minutes, and another 35 minute session of uh, cloud events in action? And what would you show in that one? What does it look like in production? Like how are people using these things or how do we intend them to use them? Kind of like go through use cases and stuff? Yeah, kind of like a, a case study. Do you actually have enough material to fill 35 minutes? Well, we have three people that are using it in production, right? So we can go see what they're doing. True. And we can also have them talk lots of it. <laughs> Uh, you got a question there on the chat, Scott. Are you volunteering to demo the Go SDK line? I, I did that in oh. Barcelona and it was super fun. Yeah. Okay. So I guess, Scott, what you're proposing is one 35 minute session that just gives an overview of the project itself and status and stuff. And then cloud events in production, which is not necessarily a deep dive. I mean, it kind of is, but it's more business related, I guess, or, or usage related. What do people think about that? I think that's definitely better than like just doing an intro and a deep dive. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so to the, to the original question I was asking though, Scott, would you prefer to actually have two completely separate sessions or just one 90 minute long session that does both? My, my preference would be two sessions just because people, like there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of tracks and there's a lot of overlap. Okay. Anybody else have an opinion on that? I'm okay to go with that if no one else has any comment. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Vladimir. Um, yeah. Just a quick comment on this. Uh, my experience with similar events. Um, if we have two sessions, it is important that um, the two presenters are going in sync. Otherwise, uh, there is a risk of duplicating uh, various intro materials. Yes, agreed. And uh, usually the usually the people who do the two sessions um, collaborate a lot before the events. That's usually right. not an issue. Yeah. Right. Great. So that's what we've done. So I'm not too worried about that. Good. Good. Thanks. Hey, Doug. This is Colin. Uh, we went through this exercise for Nats. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to combine it because we do have a lot of material, but we're going to do it in a way where 
we've got a short intro and then we kind of describe a, a use case and how we approach something. And then the second half is um, going down into the real details, into code, into configuration, that sort of stuff. So people can leave halfway through if they want. So you're, yeah, okay, so, you're, so you went with just one long session then? Yes, yeah, so that's what we're planning on. We, yeah. We're waiting to the last minute, but yeah. <laughs> I, I could see that working too. Yeah. One of the things I, I do like about one 90 minute long session is it gives us the freedom to, to move things around the last minute, right? If you sign up for two separate sessions, then you're, you're forcing yourself into a very clean split from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, from the get-go, right? And you can't, for example, the night before, completely rearrange the topics without completely screwing up the schedule. But with 90 minutes, all we have to do is submit an abstract now, and we can be changing stuff up to the day before. So it gives a little more freedom. That, that's one of the reasons I kind of like one 90, long, one 90 minute session. And there's no reason we have to use all 90 minutes either. 90 minutes is a long time. So what do you guys think? Scott, you seem like you might be okay with one 90 minute? Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, let, let, let's try that. I suspect if for some reason, as we work it through, if it turns out 90 minutes doesn't work, we could probably convince the organizers to let us split it into two. and even just take that 90 minutes and split it into two and put a 20 minute block in between them for uh, people to walk around. So, okay, let's do that. So this will be part one and part two. And we'll figure out the exact details later. I may ping some of you guys offline uh, later today um, to get approval for the abstract because I wanna make sure I summarized what we're gonna be talking about appropriately. So keep an eye out for that. All right. Um, okay, so here's the current proposal. You guys okay with that? Okay, not hearing any objection. I'll try to figure out something and submit that by tomorrow. Thank you guys. All right, before we jump into PRs, any other topics people think are important to bring up? All right, moving forward. All right, so this one we talked about last week. Let's try not to rat hole again on the name. So um, two sets of changes here, if I remember correctly. First, change schema URL to data schema everywhere. And doo -doo -doo. the other change is we made it a URI instead of URI reference. So that's moving the word reference there. Added URI to our type system. And instead of saying a link, I just changed it to be identifies the schema. I think those are all the changes here. I think, and I think that's consistent with what we talked about uh, on last week's call. Any questions on that? Thank you, Christoph, for the LGTM. Any questions, concerns? Any objection to approving? All right, cool. Thank you no guys. objections. Cool, thank you guys. <clears throat> if I can type. All right, next. Okay, this one changed quite a bit since last time because re we removed all the rambling text that I had in there. And let's see, what else I do in here? Okay, those are just typos. All right, here's the bulk of the change. So, um, does your question have already? Okay. So this is just adding some guidance that says, while it can be really, really short, it's recommended that it be an absolute URI, okay? Um, and we made it so that it has to be a non-empty URI reference. And I did that for both uh, source as well as, what was the other one? Schema URL, which is now data schema. So I need to merge those two. No, I won't merge it with the previous one. So I think this is the bulk of the change must be a non-empty URI reference and some guidance that says you really should use something longer unless you're in some sort of private environment kind of thing. I think that's what we talked about last time. Uh, Tim, your hands up. Yeah, so, so the, the distinction between uh, absolute and relative URI reference is, is crisp and clear and, and that's fine. I think the discussion about length is, is, does not add value. Um, 
you know, if, if, if I'm using a relative URI reference, you know, images slash cat is a perfectly good, fine relative URI reference. Um, I, I just don't think length is helpful. Well, you, okay. You said length, you mean you talk about the word short here? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so, is there another? I, I don't want to change it to a different phrase that says meaningful or unique or something like that. I, I just couldn't think of a better phrase. If you want to suggest a different phrase to put in there? I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think it's relevant at all. If it's a, all, all we care about, is it a valid relative URI reference or is it a absolute? Once it's, once it's, once you, once you've allowed relative URI references, then foo is a perfectly good one. So you're proposing to even drop this recommended statement? No, I, I, I like the recommended statement that absolute should be used. Okay, so you just want to drop use, this. If you're not going to, yeah, right. Got it. Okay. Um, okay, I don't mind that. Um, I, I'm okay with basically taking this bit and sticking it into the constraints section. What do other people think? Yeah, Tim's recommendation makes sense. Just by saying that an absolute URI should be used is probably enough. Okay. Because I mean, a relative URI is totally meaningless unless you know the base anyhow, right? And so you, you, the assumption is people would never look at the naked relative URI. They would look at a form composed with the base, which should be meaningful in and of itself. Okay, fair enough. I don't mind removing the, the rambling text. That's fine. Okay. Anybody else want to speak up in favor or against Tim's um, edit? Okay, so the current proposal is to take the PR and remove this paragraph, but keep this highlighted text and move it down to the constraints section. Any, any concerns with that? Any objections? Sorry, you're, you're gonna retain, oh, I see, I see. No, never yeah. mind. Yeah, remove the, highlight, move the highlighted text down to constraints and then remove the whole paragraph. Any objections? Well, that's a that's what the constraint section is, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we're not completely crystal clear. Sometimes we put constraints up here and sometimes we do it down there. It's a little, we're a little fuzzy on that, but we can worry about that later if we want to. Okay, is there any objection to me making this editorial? I, I consider it to be strictly editorial. Is there any objection to me making this editorial change after the call and assume that the PR is still approved? I'll, I'll, I'll wait till we get one or two LGTMs to make sure I didn't do any kind of syntax typo, but you guys okay with me merging this offline? I'm fine with it. Okay, cool. Any objections to do heading down that path? Okay. Last chance then while I type this up. Any objection to that proposal being approved? Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Okay, cool. I'll make that change. Thank you guys. All right, this one should hopefully be easy. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, there was no pointer in our readme to the SDK doc that we have. Um, so I just basically added that. The only other thing I did is I added the word requirements there. The title of the doc was just Cloud Events SDK and it seemed like it was missing something or some other word after that describing what it was. So I put the word requirements there. If you guys have another word uh, like recommendations or guidance or something, I'm okay with switching it. I just felt like not having another word in there felt a little bit awkward to me. Um, but that's basically all this one is, just add a pointer to it. Any questions on that? Any objection then to adopting it or approving it? Okay, and obviously if you guys have another choice of words in there, we can do another PR later. It's obviously not a big deal. Thank you guys. All right, next biggie. <clears throat> Hopefully, oh, Tim, is your hand still up or is that old? Oops. Okay, no problem. All right, so hopefully most people have been following the, the chats that have been going on uh, through the PRs and stuff. Um, so for those of you who haven't, um, Based upon the conversations that were going back and forth between uh, Christoph and Clemens, um, mainly around the PR that, that Christoph submitted, 
as a wording change to, to, to Clemens. Um, I made a suggestion somewhere in one of those comments of possibly just sort of reducing what we say down to a bare minimum. Clemens suggested I turn it into a PR, so that's what I basically did. Um, and so this PR basically does a couple of things. First is it removes the notion of data as an attribute, which, it, and I, I know that technically when we do this structured format, it appears as a sibling in the, for example, in the JSON as, as another attribute. But from the abstract perspective, if we stop referring it to it as an attribute, then we don't have to jump through hoops to say, our data types apply to everything but data, right? Um, because we want to say they apply to all attributes, but not data. It gets really kind of funky. So I removed the notion of data as an attribute and just said, just, I just called it data whenever appropriate. I think I got all the places where we have phrases like data attribute and stuff like that. I uh, may have missed one or two. So if you guys spot them in the future, let me know. But that was the, that's the first big change I made is stop referring to data as an attribute. Um, the other change, let me just go down here. I think this is the spec. Okay, the other big change is in the spec itself, what I did is I moved the type system to be under the contracts attribute section. It felt a little awkward to me as I was going through these changes to have these two separate sections kind of point to each other and relate to one another. It seemed to flow nicer to just say, we define attributes and here's what it can be defined as in terms of a data type. And it just seemed like it, it flowed a little better. I don't think I necessarily changed any of the semantics in here. The only thing I did do is added Boolean, um, mainly because I thought that would, that should be a valid type that people want to perhaps define uh, for an extension. It seemed like a very natural thing for people to say yes or no, on or off kind of a thing. Um, I also added this stuff here that said all attributes must be of scalar type. I don't think that actually changes the semantics now that we've killed off map. I just added this to make it explicitly clear um, that they must be of scalar and they must not be of complex type, meaning maps and structures, since we explicitly, explicitly disallow that. The reason I added this was because um, we now don't have map in there anymore, but we don't explicitly say you can't use map. And so that left open the possibility of someone actually defining an extension that might have used map. And I thought based on previous discussions, we were headed down the path of banning that. So I wanted to make it explicitly clear. Uh, but then the bulk of the change, oh, another one. Uh, in the optional section, op optional attribute section, I said optional or conditional, because as Christoph was pointing out, um, while some of these, well, technically all of these are optional, they actually may be required based upon what you're adding into the cloud event. So for example, the content data encoding, I'm sorry, data content encoding may actually be required depending on your serialization. So I had the word conditional there since I think that might be a little more accurate. But the real bulk of the change is up here. And I'll let you guys read this. Um, basically, all I'm trying to say in here is, if when you serialize data, uh, and, in your, and you're in the structured format, if, this, if the normal serialization of data does not align with the serialization of your envelope itself, uh, you may need to base64 encode it. And in, in particular, use the, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, well, I guess this is on the, hold on. This is on data content encoding. So basically say you may, you, you're probably gonna have to use this attribute if you can't do the normal serialization. And we have to talk about using base64 to do the encoding at that point. Um, and here's the stuff down here. We're talking about if you can't do it in its normal, in its normal encoding or it's encoding based upon the uh, data content encoding string or value, I should say. Or data content type, I should say, sorry. And I think here's the last big section. Now in data, uh, we removed its type. So it's not even any anymore. It's just almost undefined. I actually originally had the word undefined in there, but then I removed it per Clement's suggestion, uh, just not even getting any confusion about it. So basically it just says it's the payload uh, defined by the data content type, schema URL points to it, um, talks again about the native syntax if you need it, you're supposed to use a data content encoding. If, you, if the native syntax per data content encoding or its native type doesn't align with your envelope. And therefore you must use the data content encoding attribute. Anyway, uh, yes, Scott, base 64. All right, 
like I said, hopefully most of you guys have been following the conversation during the week, but any questions on that? Really? Nothing? Any comments? Yes, one. Mm -hmm. So, so this is we had this is so this is the fourth proposal that we had around this, and this seems like the best one to me um, because that is uh, the best of all the compromises because the problem is is difficult. The only thing um, we end up with uh, where, where I see risk, and I mentioned that in my comment, was um, with um, you know forwarding through intermediaries. Um, when you have data that contains dates um, and you come in with, um, you know, this self-contained um, um, event that is all in Avro and that contains a date and you run that into a intermediary and intermediary now sends that onwards using JSON. Because of JSON's um, ambiguity in, in terms of how dates are encoded, because sometimes they're RFC 1123 and sometimes they're, they're RFC 3339, which means one is ISO and the other one is not. Um, you might end up in a place that you receive it, you receive the date um, as JSON and then it's, you, you end up with the wrong expectation effectively. Um, and that's the, only, that's the only data type that I'm really worried about because um, JSON has the weakest type system and uh, you know, business. And um, so I was suggesting to make a rule in the JSON event format to say, if you are encoding a date, then that should always be RC3339. Um, and that's the, that's the only concern I have about this one. So is that something, Clemens, you think we could work on in a follow-on PR? Yeah, I just want to point that point. Or I just want to point that out. Like th that's that's a rule I would love to add to the JSON event format. Even though it should stay out of the data thing, I think taking a stance while JSON doesn't is good. Okay, yeah, I asked you a question, but I don't think I had a chance to see it yet. Does this concern of yours apply just to JSON, or does it apply to any structured format? It, it applies specifically to JSON because JSON is the only type we're dealing, the only encoding we're dealing with that doesn't um, have a notion of um, what a date is. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We can, we can work on that one as a follow on to this. I think it's a, that's a minor change. Any other questions or comments? I have a comment. Mm -hmm. You're using likely need to be base 64 encoded. So likely need to be is probably not language we want to use in the spec itself. We want to use like should or must or be more assertive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did it, did it. I think I probably use that because I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Clemens, but I think in the proposals before we didn't mandate you had to use base 64, did we? Or, or was it just one of the rec recommended ones? And keep in mind, this is also just in a for example section. I mean, do you guys want to make it stronger and say base 64 is the only one we use? Um, for string encoding, we actually say that, don't we? For string encoding? Data content encoding. Uh, string... I don't think, we say, we, ah. say, we say base 64 must be supported, but we don't say must be used. Yeah, that's right. It basically, this is, this is, um, hang on. Uh, while you're thinking about that, Clemens, uh, Roberto, I assume this is the line you're worried about, right? I, I don't think that line is necessarily a problem per se, because it, this is just saying that if you have binary data, you may need to be 64 encode it, because it's technically possible that your binary data could be the word hello which does not technically need to be base 64 encoded. Mm, I see where you're going. Right. Okay. I could live with that. Okay. That, that, uh, that's, that's my rationale for why I think it's technically okay. If, if you think that sentence is going to cause a problem, I'd almost rather just remove the entire sentence since it's just a for example anyway. But I thought it might be useful. But like I said, I don't have a huge preference on that one. No, I think the example is useful. I, I would prefer to keep it. Okay. 
So Clemens, back to your other, back to what you were talking about. Um, um, my network connection is terrible. Um, but yeah, this is just an example. This is this is a, I mean, this is a general purpose field that we define for a string. But obviously, this could also hold um, other encoding information, just like it does in HTTP. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments, concerns? Dare I ask? Any objection to approving? Holy cow. Okay. So, question for you guys. And thank you guys very much, especially <clears throat> Clemens, Christoph, and James. Hopefully, you're listening to the recording. Thank you guys very much for all your work on this. I believe that allows us to close this PR from James, right? Make sure we look at the right one. Right, Christoph and Clemens, we can close this one now, right? Yeah, I just want to say that we should send James a big thank you because I think what we ended up was pretty much what he uh, proposed in the first place. Yep, I agree. Yeah, I, would, I would do that. that. Thank you. That's a good reminder. Okay, now a question for you guys. There are two issues opened up by James. I believe that we can now close both of them, but I wanted to get your guys' take on it just before I did that. Can we close this one as a result of all the various PRs that we've done recently between killing off map and the one we just approved? Clement, since you commented on this one, do you think we could kill off this, this issue? Uh-oh. Clem uh, Clemens, you still there? Okay. Anybody else have any opinion? I'm going to pick on you, Christoph. <laughs> you've been deeply involved in this one. You think we can close these well, two, I'd Christoph? Say, I'd say ask James, but I, I think it should be fine. Okay. Okay, I'll go with the assumption that we can. We'd always reopen if I'm wrong. Okay. Cool. All right. Next. Thank you guys very much. Let's go to Tim's PR. Now, I don't think this one's ready to go for two reasons. One, uh, I missed the Tuesday deadline. However, I think there might be some outstanding questions on this one. So, Tim, you want to talk to this one and explain what's going on here? Yeah, the core idea was that this thing used to say printable Unicode characters, and, and there ain't no such thing. Um, having, having said that, the sentiment was that having garbage Unicode characters that have no interoperability value and no semantics is, is a bad thing. And I did a hasty first stab of that, just ruling out the control characters. But if people buy into the notion that we would like to be fussy about the repertoire of Unicode characters that's allowed in, uh, in, in uh, what's the right term, non-data attributes, um, uh, then we should develop a, a thoughtful list, which we can get by stealing from various other standards. Um, uh, you know, uh, no, uh, no new line characters, no non-character characters, no control characters, probably no naked surrogates. Um, there, there is a well-known list of Unicode garbage that is reasonably straightforward to, to exclude. Okay, what do people think? Uh, I think it's great. The only thing now that we have removed the string type from data, I think we can also uh, drop support for line feed and carriage return because that will cause problems in HTTP headers. Otherwise, I think it's perfect. Yeah, that's what you just agree. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm hearing is keep the direction the PR is going, just go further and, and get the get the full list of uh, either valid or invalid characters, whichever way you want to write it up. Yeah, so I'll take an action item to come back with a, a revised version with a proposed list of, of garbage that we would want to exclude um, harvested from other uh, standards and so on. All right. Any objection with heading that direction from anybody? All right, cool. Thank you, Tim. Um, hold on. <clears throat> All 
All right, cool. Thank you, Tim. And just a reminder, the deadline would be by next Tuesday if we want to get approved next week. Um, all right. In that case, technically, that's it for the open V1 PRs. Now, let's go into wish list items. This one is from Evan. Um, Scott, do you want to talk to this one or did you want me to try to take a stab at it? Scott, you have a cough mute? Yeah, the, this is related to the conformance testing. Yeah, uh, basically, yeah, I think so. I, I'm sorry, I haven't seen this yet. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I'll, I'll, since I've commented on it, so basically, what uh, what Evan did here is he basically produced a whole bunch of different uh, sample inputs for really, really weird um, uh, cloud events. In particular, let me jump to some funky stuff. Let's ignore the data one. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Yeah, so he did some weird stuff here, like for the ID. He has some funky characters in there. Here's a better example, right? He did a whole bunch of really weird stuff. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Tim, your PR, if it gets adopted, would probably radically change what Evan has in here, right? In terms of valid cloud events going forward? Uh, looking, um, you know, the, the weird uh, Asian characters and so on are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. The emoji are fine. Um, are they? Okay. So I'm not sure. Okay. 0022, I have no idea what 0022 is. I suspect. I'll have to, I'll have to. Okay, I, I thought I thought maybe you were going to uh, dis discard emojis and stuff. Would it be better for us to hold off on resolving this one until your PR gets in there to know what the valid characters are? Uh, two two is just a question. It's just a quotation mark. So uh, um, I, my instinct is this is probably just fine. But we yeah let's, let's yes I agree. Okay. So anyway, so this PR is basically giving a whole bunch of funky cloud events. So people, I guess as, as Scott said, can do some sort of conformance testing and stuff, but make sure people are aware that they may get some weird characters in there and they need to be prepared for it. Um, since I'm not sure how many people have actually looked at this, I'll, and we need to wait for Tim's PR anyway, let me just say that, uh, let me just ask people to please review it for next week. It's been out there for, for quite a while. I don't think it's had really radical changes, um, but I'd like to get it resolved next week if we can, uh, once um, once Tim's PR is approved. So anyway, any questions about this? Okay, so please, when you guys get a chance, take a look at that one. All right, next. So this is a change, I believe I made this one because Clemens in particular said we didn't have a leave of absence clause in our government stock. So basically what I tried to do is add some statement here that said if you are going on a leave of absence, and it doesn't mean you have meeting conflicts, right? If you are actually not working, like you're going on sabbatical or vacation or something like that for an extended period of time, um, you can ask for a leave of absence and that basically puts your your attendance tracking on hold till you get back, um, but you can't do it, you know, just willy nilly. You got to send a note to the mailing list in advance, um, and just it basically gives people an out, and they don't have to <clears throat> lose voting status based on vacation and sabbaticals and stuff like that. So you guys can read the text here. Okay, any questions on this? Any concerns? Clemens, you think the wording of this is sufficient for your concerns? Clemens, your network's still having issues? Oh, yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. No, use a different network. Yeah, this is okay. This is okay? Okay. <laughs> there you go, Christoph. All right. Okay. Uh, any objection to this change then? No objection. All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Man, we are just flying today. I love it. I, I apologize for Germany having so, many, so much vacation. <laughs> yeah, you Europeans tend to do that a lot. Yeah. All right. 
Um, let's see. Technically, we're done with all the PRs and stuff. So let's jump to a discussion item that Mark suggested last week that we have, which is a quick discussion, or maybe not quick, but a discussion around our governance model, in particular around the way we do voting rights. As you guys all know, we do voting rights based upon attendance on this phone call, uh, not based upon PRs and stuff like that, or PR captain stuff, which is slightly different than some open source projects, or most open source projects, I should say. Um, I will state, though, that from my experience anyway, and I, I think, Clemens, you may experience this as well, from, from normal standards bodies that work on specs, a lot of times um, things like this are based upon attendance um, because they don't typically track PRs and stuff like that. Um, but I don't know if it's universal. It's just in my experience, it, it's been based upon attendance, which is one of the reasons we headed this way to begin with was um, because we were doing a spec, not code. And the realization that uh, a lot of our work is done in a very collaborative nature. For example, the, the PR that we just resolved today, where we have four different versions of the PR, we landed on one particular one, but only one person is technically gonna get credit from a PR account, and that's not fair, um, since it was a collaborative effort from at least three or four different people. So that's why PR account isn't necessarily the best guide for us, since we do a lot of collaborative offline discussions and back and forth and stuff, especially wordsmithing. So anyway, do people feel like we need to change our governance model or you know, have any questions, concerns, desire for changes? Now's the time to raise it. So the, this topic has come up in the past by some, some other people and it's um, related more towards we are not conducive for every time zone to be able to participate. Uh, and being able to ensure that they have a voice and a vote uh, in some of the discussions that we have, uh, which those discussions could be considered uh, through email as well. Sure. I, I have a comment, but does anybody else want to comment on that first? Okay. Yeah, my reaction to that is it is definitely true from a technically voting right perspective, somebody like James, who I believe is in Australia, is probably never gonna get voting rights. However, the way we tend to operate is more along the lines of almost everybody has a veto option, right? So James had, had some serious concerns about that part of this, you know, that data part of the spec. He opened a PR, we went back and forth. Clemens bent over backwards to try to work with him. It, it, from a time zone perspective. So uh, in my opinion, almost anybody tends to have a veto power in terms of blocking the PR from going in. Obviously at some point we do end up taking votes. And at that point, it's a shame that James didn't get a vote necessarily if this thing actually did come down to a formal vote. But relative to PRs getting rushed through and, and, and the voting members get to steamroll anybody, we tend to operate under the, under the premise that if you have a concern and you raise it up to the mailing list or the issue or the PR, we tend not to just ignore that. And we wait until we get some kind of resolution. And it's very rare that we actually go forward with a vote. And the fact that almost every single one of our votes have been a landslide in one way or the other tells me that um, it's not that bad off, right? We never get to the case where it's like a five, four vote kind of a thing. But that's just my take on it. So I agree that it is a potential concern. I don't think it's actually been a concern for us in practice. But I'd be curious to know if anybody else had a different opinion on that. Yeah, plus in controversial cases like that, we always or we often also do an offline vote in the PR itself. So that gives people opportunity to vote in those cases, like on, 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 instead of making the vote during the meeting itself. True, the only downside to that is, or the only flip side to that is, somebody like James who can never attend the phone call will never have voting rights but he could still voice his opinion. That is definitely true. Right, correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a matter of binding versus non-binding. Right. Yeah, I, I struggle to make the time. That's why I'm not always here. Um, it's 5 p.m. for me, which is a difficult time of the day, but um, I'll make it when I can. But I think what we have works, so I'm okay with that. Anybody else want to comment? We do waste a lot of time with the headcount. <laughs> I know that's been a sore point for you. And like I said, I'm okay if people want to, to, to stay there here in the chat and, and avoid the headcount thing. I don't mind getting rid of that. I just, to be honest, the reason I do the headcount thing 
is because, and this is my paranoia based upon real life experience, is people play games. And I've had cases in the past with other groups, not this one, necessarily. actually, that's not true. This group has done it once or twice. I just haven't called it out. But in previous groups I've been in, people will do things like add their name to the agenda, but then never show up if all you're doing is letting people self-register. Or they'll, they'll get on the phone call and their name will appear in the Zoom, but they, they walk away permanently, right? So they just log in and walk away. And that's not to me on the phone call. Now, granted, you know, once you guys say I'm here, you could technically vanish and I'll never know. But at least that tells me you're at least awake enough to actually say, yes, Doug, I'm here. That's, that's the only reason I do it. I'm, it's, it's just to try to avoid game playing because I have seen it done quite badly in the past. And like I said, I've seen it, I think, twice so far in this group. I just haven't called it out. That's why Doug randomly calls on you during the <laughs> Then there's that aspect, yes. <laughs> Ginger's living in fear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're on so you, Doug. We're yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. But I agree with you, Scott. Uh, it is annoying. But luckily, it, you know, I, I do try to get it all done within the first three minutes. And usually that gives people, you know, a chance to switch from other phone calls anyway, because I'm not sure we'd start the call within the first three minutes anyway. So I, I know it's a sore point for you, Scott. But I, I, if you have another suggestion on how to make sure people aren't gaming the system, I'm, I'm open to it. If it ain't broken, that fix it. I think it's fine the way it, it, it is. Well, let me ask that question. Does anybody think we need to make a change? I think, I, I, I think I'm fine without a change. I wanted to just bring this up as make sure that we were all clear about the governance model and ensuring that it was still working for us. Okay. It's a fair question. Is there someone else who's going to say something in there as Mark was trying to talk? No, it was me. I was going to suggest that we vote on it. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. <laughs> uh, get a nice dig in there. Okay. Uh, in that case, any, anything else related to this discussion if you want to bring up at all? Just a good question about the thing we just approved a few minutes ago for the voting rights. Uh, you, the, 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 the text says via email. Is it okay via Slack as well, or does it actually have to be via email? So the reason I did that was because I wanted it to be a little more public. If you guys are comfortable with someone mentioning it through the public Slack channel, I just don't want someone to ping me alone. I'd rather more than one person see it. If you guys want me to add through the public Slack channel, I'm okay with that as well. I, 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 don't, have, I don't have a preference. Would you guys prefer that? I would. Okay. Anybody else have an, an opinion one way or the other? I would, I would also add that you know, someone could mention it in this in this meeting as well saying, I'll be out on these dates and we can just add it to the. No, that's too vague. It could easily. Think so? Okay. I'm okay either way. Anybody else have an opinion one way or the other? Okay, I'll, I'll add the Slack channel. We can always add more modes of communication later if we want to, but I'll add. Um, just to make it more formal, is there any objection to adding Slack channel as an approved mechanism to notify your leave of absence status? Okay, cool. I will make that change and I will wait until I get one or two LGTMs to make sure I didn't mess up the text as I make that change. All right. In that case, believe it or not, we are actually at the end of the agenda. Are there, is there any other business people would like to bring up at all? I have a question, but it might be more suitable for the STK call. It's after this. Okay, that's fine. It's only in eight minutes, so we can wait. Yep. Okay, in that case, Scott's favorite subject. Uh, Jeff, are you there? Jeff Holland? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Is there anybody else I missed relative to the roll call? Here's the complete list. Hey, this is Vlad. Hey, Vlad. I missed you. I apologize. I joined a bit late. Sorry. Yep, no problem. Anybody else? It's uh, Heinz as well. Oh, hey, you're back. I tried to talk yeah, to you earlier, but then you vanished. Uh, nasty vacations. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I meant you were on the call earlier, and then you vanished, right, as I was trying to get you to speak Oh, up. yeah. It, uh, I, I was uh, dialing in, and uh, all of a sudden, everything literally froze on my uh, browser, so I tried it again. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, all right. Before I answer your question, Christoph, uh, anybody else I missed for roll call? 
Okay. Relative to Christoph's question about did we get all V10 issues, um, I actually don't think we did yet, to be honest. I need to double check because some of these issues we can now close. Um, do, 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 I think, let's see, starting at the bottom. Okay, we need to decide on this one from Thomas from ages ago to, to see whether we've actually done basically testing and, and usage testing to make sure that we actually uh, use this in a world of experience. Uh, this one is Evans PR. I think we can close this one. I think Thomas, I'm sorry. I think Tim's will deal with this one. That one we did. All right, consider moving the webhook spec. That one's an open question. I think Clemens, you had a comment on that. I need to look at your comments and respond. Uh, if any, worst case scenario, if we actually do that, it's removing a document. So it, it, that'd be an easy thing if we do. Um, but worst case, but best case scenario is we change nothing. So it's either gonna be a very bullying kind of a thing in my opinion. So yeah, I yeah. think we're almost done with issues. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, looking for whether we, there's a good place for that uh, document to move. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't finished that discussion yet. So there's, uh, but that's also going to be interesting then because it's like, there's a place, I think there's a place within, within the Linux Foundation where that might be able to move or within CNCF where that might be able to move. There's a, there's a spec, spec team. And then there's also an effort within W3C, but then, you know, the document has been created here. So there's all kinds of interesting complications on mo moving that out to W3C. I don't even know how that works. So we're, we're, there's some, some Microsoft standards people will talk about how that might work out. So because I certainly don't want to abandon the spec per se. Mm -hmm. All right. Because I think, I think the mechanisms that we have there are useful um specifically the abuse protection and and just a you know, the fact that you deliver an event with using a post that's something that the our http uh, binding doesn't specify it basically just binds the the um uh, the event to an http message but it doesn't even say that you deliver with posts it doesn't talk about you know, the error codes you expect all those things are in the webhook spec so if we're dropping that then we're dropping a bunch of interoperability features um, that we have currently in this repo. All right. Well, okay. We, yeah, we, but we can continue that discussion uh, yeah. offline, but I think that might be the only one that's actually outstanding, Christoph. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think over the last couple of weeks, we, we did some really good progress here on closing things out. And um, it may be, uh, you know, we may get to the point where assuming we merge Tim's PR next week, where next week we may actually consider going to 0 0.9 and making that a release candidate and put us in that, you know, testing mode that Thomas was looking for in his issue down here on 202. And, you know, make sure everybody reads the spec, you know, the fine tooth comb, looks at their implementations of this stuff, do some testing, and then we may be on the verge of 1.0. Wouldn't that be cool? Nice. Yeah, so we may be, we may be really close. Wouldn't that be cool if we went 1.0 before KubeCon? Oh, that'd be awesome. Anyway, don't want to get our hopes up. All right, any other topics then? All right, cool. In that case, we are done. Thank you guys. And just a reminder, in four minutes, we have the SDK call if you guys are interested in that, or for those of you who are interested, I should say. All right, cool. Thank you guys. We'll talk again next week. Thanks, All right, thanks, Doug. Yep. Thanks, bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be right back. I need to check on something.